Hey everyone, Wolflord Row here. So Magnus Week is underway. And yesterday we began by taking a look at his brotherhood with Perturabo, discussing how Magnus, despite himself, just couldn't heed the warnings of those closest to him, even from the earliest days of the Crusade. And now today, we discuss how the seeds of Nikea were sown as Magnus reunited with the Lord of Winter and War, Lehman Russ. Spoiler warning to begin, the events we are discussing today are from the Horus Heresy novel A Thousand Sons by Graham McNeil. As always, I really recommend you read the story for yourself first, as that's the best way to enjoy the lore for yourself. Not only that, we help to support the Great Games Workshop and Black Library, because without them, we don't have this amazing lore to talk about. I will put a link in the description as always. But with that said, let's just jump straight in. Now it's hard discussing the character of Magnus without mentioning Lehman Russ, if not nigh on impossible. However, long before the cataclysmic events of the burning of Prospero, the foundation that would build to that dramatic conclusion were well and truly laid. It was during the later years of the Great Crusade that the forces of free legions would descend upon the world of Arkreach Secundus. The Thousand Sons led by Magnus, the word bearers led by their Primarch Lorgar, and lastly the Space Wolves, of course led by Lehman Russ. For over six months, the forces of the Imperium battered the world, until finally the end of the campaign became apparent, and the time for a final assault on the last stronghold still standing drew near. For the first time in the campaign, Magnus and Russ would come face to face. As the Wolf King came to inform his brother, the time had come. As Russ arrives at the Thousand Suns forces, Ariman feels as if the very chill of winter is stalking the air, goosebumps racing across his skin. The aura of the Wolf King so powerful, Ariman has no choice but to shut himself away from the psychic world, in fear of being psychically blinded. But as Russ interrogates Ariman for Magnus's whereabouts, the Primarch of the Thousand Sons arrives. However here, unlike the fond affection we saw yesterday between Magnus and the Lord of Iron, here there appears to be none. A simple shake of the hands as the two Primarchs greet each other for the first time in 30 years. Russ's wolves growling at the fellow Primarch, who sends them cowering back to their master with a look. And here we get an absolutely stellar interplay between the two Primarchs. Russ looked Magnus up and down. That cloak makes you look like the enemy. It's the feathers. Or perhaps their cloaks make them look like me. Either way, I don't like it. You should get rid of it. A cloak is a liability in battle. I could say the same of that mangy wolf pelt. You could, but then I'd have to kill you, replied Russ. You could try, said Magnus, but you wouldn't succeed. Is that what you think? It's what I know. Now I absolutely love this. There's that element of danger, and yet just that glint of humour, as if the Primarchs are enjoying the banter. All the while, Ariman is standing there just absolutely aghast at the two Primarchs, unbelieving that they're talking to each other in this manner, worrying that the whole universe is about to end. Two of the sons of the Emperor about to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. 
The mere thought of it at this point, still inconceivable. But then he notices the edge of a smirk on Russ's face, and the glimmer of enjoyment in Magnus's eye. You get the sense that this is a play the two Primarchs have played out on several encounters before. They may not be the closest of brothers, but their differences are held at bay, and they fight together in his name. Regardless of their differences, they are united by that. Their conversation continues in a more familiar tone, with Russ informing Magnus to gather his forces. The time to strike is now. The three Primarchs will lead their forces against the last stand of the enemy. And the battle is fierce, with the Thousand Suns pressing into the enemy stronghold as the Space Wolves directly assault the heart of the enemy, giving no quarter to the kings who dared oppose the Emperor, and they destroy everything in their path. We then catch up with Ahriman, who is leading his men through the ruin of the city, the last dying remnants of the battle beginning to die out, as a psychic shout of immeasurable power rips through the Thousand Suns, the psychic wave sending many of them into painful fits and spasms, completely overwhelming some to the point of death. This psychic force was the howl of Lehman Russ. Now, allow a wolf lord a little divergence here, but man, that's what I'm talking about. The wolf howl of Russ is a psychic shockwave, so full of violence and war, it overwhelms even the most powerful sorcerers of the Thousand Suns. Russ was engineered to go against all the many foes of the Emperor. He is the Emperor's executioner, and that includes, most specifically, against psychic powers. It makes you wonder if the two lost Primarchs, who Russ is heavily rumoured to have taken out, were perhaps heavily psychic as well. But back to the story at hand, this howl of rage implies to Araman that something has gone amiss, and he sets off immediately to find Magnus. Eventually finding his father, along with more of his legion, defending the Great Library. Magnus, of course, as is his way, is seeking to save the knowledge of these people, to research and add it to his own. The problem, however, is a company of Space Wolves arrived not long after him, and their intent on following their Primarch's order. They sought to destroy the library and Magnus has stopped them. Now, two loyal forces of Adeptus Astartes face each other across the causeway, bracing for war. The Thousand Suns lining up before the library, the Space Wolves at the other end. The howl of Lehman Russ was most likely him being told of Magnus's betrayal, and the Wolf King was coming. Now, this moment, while pivotal in the future of Magnus, truly is the perfect example of his mindset. Let's make it clear here, the orders of Russ to level the final stronghold were known to everyone. Whether you agree with it or not, the orders were clear, and it does appear that Russ had somewhat of overall command. At least that can be inferred, by Russ summoning Magnus and Lorgar for the final assault. But here Magnus of course refuses, deciding instead to protect a library of knowledge in the midst of battle. Now, I'm not one for burning books by any stretch of the imagination. The pursuit of knowledge is a valiant one, and at times, the pen can truly be mightier 
than the sword. But this is a debate that should have been taken up before the battle. And I really feel the onus here falls on Magnus. There's no way he didn't know beforehand that he was going to keep this grand library intact. It's his goal in every campaign he prosecutes, to gather more knowledge, to harvest the civilization of its intellect. Now you can say it's my Space Wolves bias talking, but I really don't think so. Magnus absolutely should have broached this subject with Russ before the assault. That Russ can do whatever he wishes with the city, but he wants the library intact. And I've no doubt there could have been an argument about it. For in Russ's mind, these were traitors who defied the Emperor. But that would have been an argument of words. And the fact is, Magnus didn't speak of his intent before. And now, we have the very real risk of an argument of false. So we now have to ask, why didn't Magnus mention this before? And for me, the most logical conclusion is the same as most often with Magnus. His arrogance. He most likely thought he would take the library and that would be the end of that. Russ's whelps would back down and leave the library to Magnus. He was a Primarch after all. Unfortunately, however, he severely underestimated the wolves of Russ. And he may be a Primarch, but he is not their Primarch. Regardless of anything else, they will follow Russ's order to the end. And he has ordered the entire city to be leveled to the ground. And now, two loyal legions are going to war. And as Araman calls for his Primarch to see sense, Magnus's anger boils, demanding to get Russ's respect. And there's a really key line here that will echo through the years of law to come. It is too late, Azek, said Magnus, his voice haunted by some nameless fear. It has already begun. Magnus and the Thousand Sons hold the end of the causeway before the Great Library, a company of Space Wolves the other. The wolves slowly begin advancing behind a shield wall, pushing through the psychic barrier of the Thousand Suns, slowly forcing them back. Though still in the moment, neither side drawing their bolters, sensing that this threshold is one that neither wishes to cross. The Space Wolves' advantage is soon cut off, however, when the Sorcerers of the Thousand Suns inflict paralyzing spasms upon the Wolves' line, pushing them to the brink of death, as Ahriman calls for his fellow Sorcerers to stop, again fearful for how far events are plunging out of control. But it's too late, and the mutations that have cursed the Sons of Magnus through all their use of sorcery, have taken hold once more, and the sorcerer known as Hastar has succumbed, his body mutating in uncontrollable power, the effect threatening to overtake all of the Thousand Suns present. Magnus alone is immune to its effects, and he heads for Hastar, his lost son. The creature he has become seemingly reaching for his father, yearning for an end to his torment, for salvation from the pain. And just as Magnus reaches his son, the warp embrace shell of Hastar's body explodes, bolt shell detonating within, all eyes turning to the other end of the causeway and the bearer of the smoking gun. Lehman Russ has arrived. Oh snap, things are heating up. What a cliffhanger. You can't leave it there, Ro. Well, oh yes, I can. 
as there is a lot more talking points on this moment to come. Now, the reason I feel this is such a pivotal moment in the future of Magnus is it's this interaction more than any other that plants the seeds of what would lead to the Council of Nikea. And as much as I truly believe Magnus did not deserve the burning of Prospero, that he did not deserve to be cast as a traitor, that he never truly betrayed his father within his heart, it is very much those same flaws in his personality that led to those moments have begun this one. Like I said earlier, this whole situation should simply never have arisen and really could have just been so easily avoided. While each individual moment feels like a culmination of unfortunate events or Magnus being penalised for having the right intentions, when you add them all together, the one common denominator is Magnus. And whatever way you look at it, it's simply unavoidable. Can he truly be blameless when it keeps happening time after time? How long until we have to consider that the simple truth is, maybe Magnus has to share a large portion of the blame for his own demise? This moment more than any other could have been the most defining one because it simply led to all the others that would follow in its wake. But the question is guys, what do you think? Is Magnus in the wrong here? Should he have voiced his intentions before the battle? Or should the Space Wolves have simply ceded to the wishes of the Thousand Suns Primarch? Or is it a simple combination of the two, as is so often the case with Magnus? The repercussions of this very moment will echo for years to come, and cast Magnus to a fate his nature will simply not let him avoid. And we will discuss those repercussions tomorrow. Huge thank you to all my subscribers. Your support truly means a lot to me. It really does. And if you're new, please consider subscribing to help the channel grow. And if you enjoyed this particular vid, then why not drop a like on it too. But with that said, I am off, and I'll see you all again tomorrow, as Magnus the Red Week continues.